If it's Wednesday, a second debate, a second chance, as seven Republican presidential candidates take the stage, hoping to take some momentum away from the field's frontrunner, Donald Trump, who's skipping debate night for a second straight time. This is a Meet the Press special, live from Washington. Here's Kristen Welker. Welcome to a Meet the Press special. The second Republican presidential debate. I am Kristen Welker in Washington. For a second time, the Republican presidential frontrunner, Donald Trump, was not on the debate stage. And for a second time, one major question hung over the night, whether anyone could or would do something, anything to change the trajectory of this race. With Mr. Trump dominating the contest in both the national polls and the early states, Tonight's debate could very well have been the Republican field's last best chance to dent Trump's momentum. Well, with the debate wrapping up at the Ronald Reagan Library in Simi Valley, California, it appears Trump's grip on the race isn't going anywhere anytime soon, even as we did see some standout moments from the stage and an overall strong performance by Senator Tim Scott. Still, overall, what we saw tonight was a stage full of candidates trying to aggressively at times rise from the pack, but struggling over each other to do so. Take a listen to this moment, which starts as an exchange between Tim Scott and Vivek Ramaswamy and devolves into a cacophony of candidates. We think about the fact that Vivek just said we were all good people, and I appreciate that because last debate, he said we were all bought and paid for. And I thought about that for a little while and said, you know, I can't imagine how you could say that knowing that you were just in business with the Chinese Communist Party and the same people that funded Hunter Biden millions of dollars was a partner this of yours as nonsense. well. It's not nonsense. So look, you, you, you know, know, I'll, 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 I want to respond. These these are good people who are tainted by a broken system, and it's not the fault I, I of anybody who's involved. Some of us are tainted. Excuse me. Line, excuse me. Excuse me. Thank you for speaking while I'm interrupted. Literally. While I'm speaking. Well, no, you said bought paid for. If I may finish, you can't be on both sides. Gentlemen, you'll have your turn. One of the challenges we should have. We should have a debate between the big. Is this in China? May, Everybody knows that. If I may, if Let's I may focus address, on holding Joe if, Biden if accountable. That's what we need to be. I actually agree on. with Ron well, DeSantis, and I will say Can something. Say yes. I think you have more than time to explain yeah. your point. Well, if I, I was interrupted by a lot of people here, and I want to be respectful I've because I yeah. believe these you were are good respectful people, last bit. But I do not yeah. believe in these. We're sitting here in the Reagan Library. Yes, I wish you would do not. In the honor of Ronald Reagan's library, if I may, from one Tim, from one admirer of Ronald Reagan to another, from one admirer of Reagan to another, we cannot do deals with Four years ago. This isn't commander. productive. I, I want to hear about that. I Let's have a policy debate. What's going on? I'll, I'll Let us have a policy debate. Actually actually matter. Matter. Just one of many moments that was hard to hear, notably the first big knock on the frontrunner, Donald Trump, who's up by 43 points nationally in our latest NBC News poll, was not on his record or his mounting legal troubles or his increasingly controversial remarks on the trail, but on not showing up to tonight's debate. And Donald Trump hides behind the walls of his golf clubs and won't show up here to answer questions like all the rest of us are up here to answer. He put $7 trillion on the debt. He should be in this room to answer those questions for the people you talk about who are Can suffering. You know who else is missing in action? Donald Trump is missing in action. He should be on this stage tonight. He owes it to you to defend his record where they added $7.8 trillion to the debt. That set the stage for the inflation that we have. Donald Trump should be here to answer for that, but he's not. And I want to look at that camera right now and tell you, Donald, I know you're watching. You can't help yourself. I know you're watching, okay? And you're not here tonight. Not because of polls and not because of your indictments. You're not here tonight because you're afraid of being on the stage and defending your record. You're ducking these things. And let me tell you what's going to happen. You keep doing that, no one up here is going to call you Donald Trump anymore. We're going to call you Donald Duck. Some of the sharpest attacks we've heard against the former president so far. Now, toward the end of the debate, Ron DeSantis did hit Trump on his abortion stance. But for the Florida governor, whose campaign is trying to frame this race as a two-man contest, this debate may not have been what he'd hoped for. DeSantis didn't speak for the first 15 minutes of tonight's debate and set up Tim Scott for one of his strongest moments of the night. 
Florida's new Black History curriculum says, quote, slaves develop skills which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit. You have said slaves develop skills in spite of slavery, not because of it. But many are still hurt. For the sentence of slaves, this is personal. What is your message to them? So first of all, that's a hoax that was perpetrated by Kamala Harris. Uh, we are not going to be doing that. There is not... There is not a redeeming quality in slavery. He and Kamala should have just taken the one sentence out. Black families survived slavery. We survived poll taxes and literacy tests. We survived discrimination being woven into the laws of our country. What was hard to survive was Johnson's Great Society, where they decided to put money where they decided to take the black father out of the household to get a check in the mail, and you can now measure that in unemployment, in crime, in devastation. If you want to restore hope, you've got to restore the family, restore capitalism, and put Americans back at work together as one American family. Our nation continues to go in the right direction. It's why I can say I have been discriminated against, but America is is not a racist country. Never, ever doubt who we are. We are the greatest country on God's green earth. And frankly, the city on the hill needs a brand new leader. And I'm asking right. for your vote. Now, unlike the first debate where Vivek Ramaswamy was able to get under the skin of some of his fellow candidates, the rest of the stage hit back tonight hard. Take a listen to an answer Ramaswamy gave on TikTok and the aggressive response from Nikki Haley. You join TikTok after dinner with boxer and influencer Jake Paul. Should the commander in chief be so easily persuaded by an influencer? So the answer is I have a radical idea for the Republican Party. We need to win elections. And part of how we win elections is reaching the next generation of young Americans. This is infuriating because TikTok is one of the most dangerous social media apps yes, that is. we could have. And what you've got, I honestly, every time I hear you, I feel a little bit dumber for what you say. Hmm. Because I can't believe no, they I hear you've Haley got a may. TikTok situation. What they're doing is these 150 million people are on TikTok. <laughs> that means they can get your contacts, they can get your financial information, they can get your emails, they can Let get just say, text messages, they can get all of this these is important. things. This is China very important for our exactly party. What they're this doing. is very important for our party, and I'm going to say And what we've seen is you've gone and you've we helped China stop. build make medicines will, in China, not America. Me, excuse you me. now wanting kids to go and get on the social media that's dangerous for all of us. You went and you were in business with the Chinese that gave Hunter Biden $5 million. We can't trust you. We so can't me, trust you. We can't something. have TikTok in our kids' lives. Well, overall, it was a dramatic and contentious night, but not for the front runner. Our NBC News team has every single angle of the Republican primary covered. We've got reporters in the debate spin room on the trail talking to voters and traveling with the former president. We will speak with the top campaign officials about how their candidates fared on stage. And we've got an all-star panel with me on set to break it all down. So let's get started with NBC's Garrett Hake, who is in the spin room at the Reagan Library. Garrett, we just played some of the highlights but I want to know what your yeah. big takeaways were. Well, Kristen, my biggest takeaway was that the two candidates who seemed most intent on changing the dynamic that you described at the top of Donald Trump way out in front and the rest of the pack hanging back were the two South Carolinians, Nikki Haley, who turned in a very strong uh, debate performance the first time around. The only candidate to see a significant polling bump after that first debate was once again extremely aggressive tonight, mixing it up with all the candidates on the stage. She was well prepared to go after Vivek Ramaswamy on that question of we can't trust you. She went after uh, Ron DeSantis on his energy policy. She even mixed it up with Tim Scott, who was the other candidate who I found surprising, in part because his team has been telegraphing for some time that he wasn't going to change his more laid back style. He was going to continue to try to float above the fray in these debates. He is, you know, one of the most popular candidates in terms of his personal likability, the way that that polls on the trail. People think of him as a nice guy. That's not always an effective thing to be on the debate stage. And that's not all we saw from him tonight. We did see a much more aggressive Scott challenging Ramaswamy 
Romney challenging some of these other candidates to try to create opportunities for himself to better introduce himself. So I was, I was struck by the aggressiveness of the two South Carolinians. And I also thought the way in which the other candidates tried to engage the absent frontrunner was noteworthy. You saw Ron DeSantis and Chris Christie go after Donald Trump a little bit on his record. DeSantis there at the very end of the debate talking about abortion, but mostly on the idea that he was disrespecting Republican primary voters by not showing up. Our polling has indicated, NBC News polling and polling by other news outlets, that going after Donald Trump directly on things like his indictments or even some of his policy positions turns off Republican primary voters. They don't want their candidates to sound like Democrats attacking Donald Trump for his indictments. So these candidates trying to find a way to take Trump down a peg have gone kind of around to a different tactic here and suggesting that he's disrespecting the primary voters by not coming and defending his record or giving them the time of day. Whether that's any more effective than going at Donald Trump directly remains to be seen, but at least it's a somewhat novel approach when so far nothing else has worked with the front runner so far ahead of the rest of the field, Kristen. Yeah, so much of what we've been covering, Garrett, is how these candidates have been struggling to figure out how to go after the GOP frontrunner. Tonight, we clearly saw them start to sharpen their attacks. I'm curious for your thoughts on Vivek Ramaswamy. He really seized the spotlight during the first debate. He tried to again tonight, but it seemed like the candidates did a better job of wresting it back from him. What was your take? Yeah, look, I think... I think Ramaswamy caught everyone by surprise in the first debate, and that wasn't going to happen again tonight. That was clear. Every other candidate on stage had their piece of Ramaswamy opposition research, whether it was something he had said about China or about TikTok or about previous policy positions or the fact that he wasn't even a very active voter until recently. Uh, they were prepared for that possibility. Ramaswamy's running a different race from everyone else. He never criticizes Donald Trump. He basically has come from political obscurity, and he doesn't have a traditional record. Record. So in some ways that makes him more challenging. But again, all these other candidates were ready for the for the opportunity to use Ramaswamy as a foil on stage tonight. Garrett Hake, as always, thank you for your fantastic reporting. I know you have a busy night in the spin room. Really appreciate it. Joining me now for a look at how some Republican voters felt about what they saw tonight is NBC's Steve Patterson, who is at a debate watch party in South Southern California. Steve, what are folks there saying to you? How did they receive this debate? What was their reaction? Southern California, Kristen, yeah, we are in Simi Valley, so we're just about two miles from the debate stage itself. There's like a golf course and a few more miles after that, and it separates us from the stage. So we wanted to find out specifically from California Republicans how they felt like the candidates performed tonight. Joining me, we have Anthony. He's 17 years old, politically motivated. We also have Sasha and Alex, married with five children ages 3 to 23. So my first question to you guys is, how do you feel like the candidates tackled the question that was first, which was the economy, and how you feel living in California in this day and age with the state of how the economy is? I really feel like that's an important issue right now, especially with the way the economy is going. It's completely declining. We're also both realtors, and for the future generations to own a house, it's almost impossible. Yeah. The, for, the affordability of everything is completely sky high. Who handled that question the best? I would say DeSantis handled it the best, the way he's going to tackle the economy and change things around. Um, I get a strong sense that he's going to do what he says. He's already done it once in Florida, so I get a good sense from him. Sasha, how do you feel like the question of education came up? How do you feel like it was handled among the candidates, specifically when it comes to this issue that we've been hearing about parental rights and who deserves to know what as far as curriculum in schools? Um, I feel like they touched on it some. I feel like they could have touched on it a little bit more. Um, I'm not sure any of them handled it as not well happening. as... Not yeah. Do you feel... So I, I take it then Trump is your candidate of choice so far if you had to choose a running mate from tr the candidates that were on stage for trump who It'd would you pence. choose? mike pence know. you feel like he was stronger tonight than in previous debates i uh i feel like he's kind of been the same i i just like how he was vice president previously and i'm still going for him now okay i want to toss to anthony who's wearing a, an elephant tie and yeah. a ronald reagan pin uh, 17 years old, so this will be your first time voting. Yes, sir. How do you feel like the candidates handled the issues that are most important to you? And who do you think won tonight? Yeah, 
I mean, me personally, the most important issue to me is a, a lot of the future of the party. Because I think the policy decisions on things like the economy, on the border, they're important, but they've been things that we've talked about forever. Yeah. Um, I'm young. I'm going to be voting for hopefully like 60 more years. I want to see a candidate who's going to build a future for our country that I would be happy with my kids living in and that I would be happy living in. And for me personally, I think Vivek is the candidate who I associate with the most. He went up there and he projected what I thought was a vision for this country rather than just different policy positions and platforms that we've been saying forever. Because the Republican Party said the same things in 2016 and in 2020 that it's saying now. Vivek, I think he came in new and he's coming in with these newer ideas. He grew up in the age of the internet and all this stuff. I, I think he's best poised for a lot of this and a lot of what I care about. A vote for Vivek. Thank you all so much for speaking with me. Really appreciate it. California Republicans exist. They matter. They're opinionated. They influence policy. There's 169 delegates up for stake. The convention is just a few days after yeah. tonight's debate. It is high stakes here in California. Kristen. Steve, very quickly, ask them show of hands. Did this debate change who any of them were going to vote for tonight? Just a quick show, show of hands. Show of hands from Kristen Welker. Did any of the candidates change your opinion on who you're going to vote for for this election? Show of hands. Anybody? No. Trump. No. no. I'm going to vote for is not there. So. Trump. <laughs> <laughs> so it's I'm hard still to make. Still the make. All right. You heard it there. Thanks, right. Kristen. Well, we appreciate hearing from the voters. It's all about them. Steve, thank you. Fantastic conversation. Great reporting. We really appreciate it. And as we mentioned, while the bulk of the Republican field was on stage in California, former President Trump spent the evening just outside Detroit speaking to auto workers at a non-union plant amid the ongoing UAW strike. Trump pledged to project American job, protect American jobs while attacking President Biden for promoting electric vehicles. NBC's Von Hilliard is in Detroit for us, where he's been following Trump's latest counter-programming event. So he was fired up there, Vaughn. I got to hear some of what he had to say. It seems like he really set his sights on President Biden squarely toward the general election. Didn't have a whole lot to say about his GOP challengers. What was your take? Right, and Chris, and it felt like an entirely different sort of a stage. We're more than 2,300 miles away from the Ronald Reagan Library, and Donald Trump for uh, more than an hour spoke to about 300 folks in the crowd, some UAW workers, some who were on strike, and he mentioned none of his Republican rivals by name. He gave about a 10-second head nod to the fact that the debate was happening tonight, suggesting that they were having a debate to become a secretary of something, in his words. He asked the crowd whether anybody should be considered as his VP, to which he said, said, nah. So for Donald Trump, he turned his attention to Joe Biden and the UAW strike that is now on in its 12th day. Of course, President Biden was here in Michigan and joined UAW leadership on the actual picket line yesterday before Donald Trump's arrival here today. Donald Trump speaking at a non-union manufacturing plant today and was not joined by UAW. W leadership who has been critical of him in his four years in the administration, which when which they say is uh, the National Labor Relations Board, as well as his Department of Labor, uh, gave greater benefits to the likes of employers instead of workers, particularly union workers and their rights to organize. But for Donald Trump here today, his focus was on winning a place like Michigan, winning the Midwest come a general election and telling this crowd here that he'd be fighting to protect their jobs. His foremost warning to Michigan voters here was that a Biden administration's second term push for electric vehicle uh, manufacturing expansion would hurt jobs here in Michigan. Of course, when you look at Donald Trump's tenure, there were several plants, including here in Michigan, that did in fact close. And the Biden administration has incentivized a transition to electric vehicle production, uh, which has led many union workers to be concerned because of a uh, lack of engines and transmission in electric vehicles leading to concerns about uh, potentially fewer jobs being available. The Biden administration pushes back, saying, though, that they are investing in electric vehicle battery production here. But this is a debate that we should, if Donald Trump holds this Republican lead, we should expect him to continue to wage against the current president, Joe Biden, Kristen. All right. Vaughn Hilliard with former President Trump's counter-programming in Michigan. Really appreciate it. Joining me now from the spin room is Governor Ron DeSantis' campaign manager, James Uthmeyer. Thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.
So I have to start with the fact that people took note of the fact that Governor DeSantis seemed to sharpen his attacks against the GOP frontrunner, saying he was missing in action. And a lot of his supporters, I think, would ask the question, what has taken him so long to get to this point, to take this type of a sharp attack against the former president? Sure. Well, as we're traveling around Iowa and talking to families, we're hearing over and over again that people are hurting. Gas is now five, six dollars a gallon here in California. Uh, new mortgage rates over eight uh, percent. Basic household goods are going up 40 to 60 percent. People are suffering and it's because of the reckless spending in D.C. And both Republicans and Democrats are to blame. The former president, he never vetoed a single thing, leading to over seven trillion increase in the national deficit, the most of any president at that time. And the reality is he is missing in action. This is not the Donald Trump from 2016. The people in this country deserve to hear a vision from every candidate that wants to be president, and he's not here. Um, he owes it to the people to defend his own record. James, I, I guess my question is, was it a mistake for Governor DeSantis not to start off on this strong foot when he first jumped into the race? Well, I actually think he did start off. I mean, right out in the race, he's pointed out the differences between he and the former president, spending, COVID in the shutdowns, uh, draining the swamp. The former president did not drain the swamp. Ron DeSantis, on the other hand, has fired numerous state officials, including two Soros prosecutors. He's focused on the issues. He doesn't get personal. And the reality is where Donald Trump has had some good ideas, and, and look, I, I voted for him, he never actually finished the job. He started the wall. He didn't finish it. He said, let's drain the swamp, but the administrative state only grew. Ron DeSantis, on the other hand, in Florida, has done everything he said he would do, and then some. He got out the red marker. He did veto after veto after veto, uh, over um, $6 billion in legislative appropriations. He kicked back to him. And now Florida's got the number one state economy in the country. James, you know, we noticed that there was a lot of crosstalk in this debate. The candidates obviously very eager to get their positions out. But do you think, given that, that Governor DeSantis or anyone moved the needle tonight? I, I think it was very clear to people at home only one candidate on that stage looked like the president, and that is Ron DeSantis. You had spats going left and right, but question after question, every issue, he has delivered. He has the proven record, and as your president, he will get the job done. The people heard that tonight. They know that. He distanced himself from the rest of the stage, and you will see this horse race continue uh, to get stronger and stronger as we get into the early states. And Ron DeSantis has one thing that no other candidate, including the former president, has. He has the most resources and the most robust operation in the early states, especially Iowa. He has county chairs in every single state, and he will spend a lot of time there. When it's cold, 20 degrees, on caucus night, Ron DeSantis is going to have the team connected to the voters that get people out to carry out their duty. Uh, he's going to do very, 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 very well in Iowa. I can't wait for it. Very quickly, there was a moment where he teed up Senator Scott for what seemed to be a strong moment for him, talking about the language of slavery curriculum in Florida. I'll read the quote. It says, quote, instruction includes how slaves develop skills, which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit. The governor dismissed it as a hoax, but it's written right there in black and white. I mean, does the governor need to shift his messaging on this to help people better understand where he stands to address the concerns of, as the moderator said, the descendants of slaves. No, the, the curriculum talks about benefits that, that slaves learn in spite of slavery. The curriculum also talks about the atrocities of slavery. Uh, Ron DeSantis is not going to fall victim to some liberal hoax that Kamala Harris has pushed. And, you know, shame on Senator Scott and the rest of the D.C. establishment for siding with Kamala Harris. No, Ron DeSantis believes in teaching history, true history, a curriculum focused on uh, civics, uh, math, science, real education, uh, not indoctrination. And that's why Florida has been ranked by U.S. News and World Rankings as the number one K-12 school system in the country, as well as higher education, too. We've banned CRT. We've banned DEI. We are focusing on getting kids jobs. That's what they want. 
and I know, I know we got to get your camera free or else we'd have a more robust back and forth over this. But James Uthmeyer, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And we do have plenty more news to get to tonight, including the race for second place. We'll have the latest polls on where the candidates stood heading into debate night. New reaction from more of the campaigns and live interviews with battleground voters. So don't go anywhere. You're watching Meet the Press special coverage of the second Republican presidential debate. I reject this idea that pro-lifers are to blame for midterm defeats. I think there's other reasons for that. Uh, the former president, um, you know, he's missing in action tonight. He's had a lot to say about that. He should be here explaining his comments to try to say that pro-life protections are somehow a terrible thing. I want him to look into the eyes and tell people who've been fighting this fight for a long time. Welcome back. I'm joined by my panel, NBC News senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson, Washington Post live anchor and co-author of Early 202, Leanne Caldwell, former Romney campaign policy advisor Lonnie Chen, who's now a research fellow at the Hoover Institution and host of the Hugh Hewitt Show on the Salem Radio Network, Hugh Hewitt. Thanks to all of you for staying up late. Really oh, appreciate it. Really I'd rather be doing it for, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we all got to watch this together. Hallie, let me start with you. We saw the abortion comments there from Governor DeSantis. He sharpened his attacks tonight in a way that we haven't necessarily seen. We're measuring in inches, not in feet here. But what were your takeaways? Well, I think you make a, an important point, and it's one that um, the, the DeSantis team is somewhat walking the line on here, yeah, right? There was yeah, clearly yeah. a sharper tone uh, against former President Trump here, even as folks close to his campaign tell me, and I'm sure others, that this is a marathon. That's how they see it, as not a sprint. I think it was notable that DeSantis, in those attacks, one that you showed on abortion, additionally on spending, tied it back to policies where he does um, take a different position than the former president, right? Trying to show that there is something substantive, as he is is also walking this line between not alienating the former president's supporters and trying to bring them under his orbit. But here's the thing that stuck with me the most. It's the end. It was that question from one of the moderators about the mathematical realities in this race. Mm. Because, sure, as, the, as Governor DeSantis said, you know, polls aren't votes. Polls do not happen on Election Day. But human beings respond to polls, right? <laughs> Likely voters respond to polls. And right now, the math is not mathing for Ron DeSantis. That's what this comes down to. Donald Trump is 40-plus points ahead in this field. And so, as you frame it as the race for second place, that's what we just watched. Yeah, Leanne, pick up on that point, because so much of what we saw tonight was this clash, candidates talking over yeah. each other. We understood why they were trying to get their points out, because they know that they're behind. But does that help the voters? Does that change the dynamic at all, to Hallie's point? Well, not only was it a lot of clashing with each other, but it was an interesting debate because no candidate was really asked the same question, no two candidates. And so it was really mm. hard for viewers to be able to contrast each other, the candidates' positions against the other. So there was not a lot of memorable policy takeaways from this debate tonight, um, but uh, they are trying to stand out. And the problem is, is that it's not just Ron DeSantis who has his trouble with the math problem. All of the candidates <laughs> exactly. put together still can't beat Donald Trump. And that's the essential problem is they're they're in a race, as you said, for second place. Yeah. But what does that mean? What does it mean, Hugh Hewitt? What does it mean? Who won tonight, do you think? Well, Ron DeSantis got a walk-off home run at the end okay. when he took control of the debate away from the moderators. And he said, I'm not going to play that game. Mm. And then he was very presidential. He's also the first candidate to mention commander-in-chief tonight, which I think is a very important thing. Uh, who won? I think Governor DeSantis was strong, I think. Governor Haley was very strong. She's the Vivek Slayer. And then Governor Christie's <laughs> got his Gatling gun out for Donald Trump, and he never takes, you know, he never answers. So those three, I think, walk away. And Ron DeSantis was number one in Iowa. Nikki Haley has moved into number one in New Hampshire, though Chris Christie will, you know, argue with you about whether or not they're out. They were arguing one for Iowa, one for New Hampshire. Made sense to me. Those three, I think, took it away. Lonnie, what's your take? And you do have Chris Christie, who said he wanted to go into this debate and keep the focus on Trump, not on Ramaswamy. I think we did see a slightly different dynamic. But, but who did you think really stood out to me? 
Well, I thought Tim Scott stood out, you know, because in part he has kind of had an uneven set of performances during this campaign. The first debate, people sort of thought he disappeared. In this debate, I thought he had a couple of nice moments. And I think people will see him as someone who wanted to come out and make some points. And I think he did. I thought the exchange that uh, you shared earlier when he was talking about the education issue in Florida and slavery and his personal story, uh, I thought that was very compelling. I think voters will find that very compelling. So I thought I thought Scott did well. I think Nikki Haley comes out of it a winner mm -hmm. as well. Her upward momentum continues. She really had some strong moments against Ramaswamy in particular. So I, I liked her performance as well. So I think Tim Scott and Nikki Haley, for me, are the two mm -hmm. that come out of this uh, in the best position. Yeah, Tim Scott walked away from the first debate. A lot of people on both sides of the aisle said he's such a nice guy. He clearly wanted to change that narrative this time. I want to play one of the first exchanges about the UAW strike. Gave everyone a chance to go after President Biden. Get everyone's reaction on the other side. Joe Biden should not be on the picket line. He should be on the southern border. You know what? If I was giving advice to those workers, I would say go picket in front of the White House in Washington, D.C. That's really where the protest needs to be. Joe Biden doesn't belong on a picket line. He belongs on the unemployment line. Biden showed up on that picket line. But why are those workers actually there? It's because of all of the spending that he has pushed through in the economy that's raised the inflation. We're missing the point, and every other network is missing the point. The reason why people are striking in Detroit is because Joe Biden's interference with capital markets and with free markets. Hugh, by the way, we saw Doug Burgum really try to push his Couple way times. into the... Yeah, okay. Goodbye, <laughs> Governor yeah. Burgum. Yeah. He gave everyone a chance to take a swipe at Biden. I play it, though, because here we have former President Trump talking to auto workers tonight, trying to counter-program this, really underscoring how important Michigan is and that constituency is. Well, I do think that the answers were pretty well delivered, with the exception of future Secretary of State Mike Pence, I think, because that was really a flat line. He had a lot of flat lines tonight. And I love the vice president. He had a lot of flat lines tonight. I do think that the best line was delivered by Ambassador Haley when she said the comments about the, the, the president. Why are they on the picket line? It's because their inflation impact on their lives. And so that was a very nicely done moment. But generally, that's, I don't think the counter program is going to work because what stuck with me, Kristen, is that repeatedly, you should have been here, you should have been here. Not Donald Duck, good line, but not Donald Duck. But if it happens three times in a row, I think he's in trouble. Yeah, I, I don't think he's going to skip the next one. I'm not sure his ego will allow him to skip the next one. I mean, all of the barbs. I, I think the Chrissy stuff gets under his skin at some yeah. point. But I will say this, on the issue of the UAW strike, this is an issue where there's actually a real difference between Republicans. There's a okay. real difference between mm -hmm. candidates on where they stand on this issue. You have some who are saying they should be more sympathetic toward the striking workers, and then you have others who have basically said, get rid of them. So this is a real policy difference between Republicans. I'm curious to see if this gets explored more as the campaign goes on. I'm also struck by some of what you're talking about as it relates to former President Trump, because prior to even the first Republican um, primary debate, one of the things that we had heard a lot from folks close to his campaign was this idea that he didn't need to show up, that right. it would be punching down, that he is stomping so hard in the polls. And by the way, he is, right, that's true, that he didn't need to go and be a part of that stage. These attacks may start to wound him. Mm. The idea that he's not showing up, is he? what's he scared of? Does he look weak? Does he not look like a fighter here? And he's known for being a fighter. Might that start to get under his skin to a degree where he does end up showing up for debate number three? What do you think, this Leah? debate seemed kind of petty. It was small. Mm. And then you have Donald Trump doing his own thing, trying to make a statement. I think that Donald Trump is as been reported and we've talked about many times he is looking forward to the general election he is ignoring what's happening here everyone else is so far behind in the polls he has no incentive it was, to show up or respond to them. To the yeah. point where his, one of his advisors said, hey, don't even, we're done, no more. Let's right. go right to the general election. Right. The not but why, and you could hear that in his voice when he was talking to the Michigan auto workers. Former President Trump was squarely focused on the general election and President Biden. I mean, he wasn't focused on his GOP rival. Because if you look at the, the way that the numbers are shaping up right now, yeah. that's his next big yeah. fight. I mean, the this former is not... president always asked, though, Kristen spent an hour with him, I spent yeah. an hour with him. He always asks off camera, do you think I should go to the debates? And I always say, yes, <laughs> you're very good at this. How in the world can you miss these opportunities? I just, I, I agree with Lonnie. I don't think he can stay away. Yeah, I think he's certainly contemplating it. That's for sure. Lonnie, was there a moment for you where you really felt the candidates carved out a policy difference in a strong way 
with the former president, where they um, did an effective job at doing that and not just hitting him on the, you're not on the debate stage. Yeah, and I thought Nikki Haley did a good job of this in the first debate and in this debate, which is basically saying, look, you had an administration that was supposed to stand for conservative Republican principles, and they ran off this massive deficit. Yes. And they spent a lot of money. They spent a lot of your money. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was effective. And I thought that refrain that a few candidates came back to is an effective attack against the Trump administration. That is something that Trump does not have a good response uh, for. And I pressed him on it. He doesn't like being asked about it that he ran up the debt. Well, but it's also, as soon as you asked that question, Lonnie, I had the same thought as you did. That's what came to mind for me, because yeah. it happened. I mean, that is the case. Right. That is an undeniable fact in the four years of the Trump-Pence administration, right, that that is the case. And so on a debate that was largely for the first 20 minutes or so focused on the economy, you, you would think that would be a natural place to draw contrast. All right. Well, go ahead. Last, I would, last, last word, I was just going to say the comments about China, which we might talk about in a little bit, I think were really, really defining, especially for Nikki Haley. She's very strong, very confident. She she hit some jabs. There. She hit Vivek Ramaswamy very hard for the fact that in 2018, his business had ties to China and really yeah. kind of cast herself again touted her foreign policy credentials as the former U.N. ambassador. And it showed tonight and in the last debate, too. All right. Well, don't go anywhere. We're going to have you guys come back. Thank you, though, for a great first conversation. I'm going to pause with all of you to bring in Caton Dawson, former chair of the South Carolina Republican Party. He's supporting Nikki Haley. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Of course, Kristen. Glad to be with you. So I want to get your take on what happened tonight. We have been talking about the fact that Nikki Haley did have a strong first debate performance. We started to see her poll numbers go up. In fact, in our latest poll, she actually beats President Biden. I thought she might reference that tonight and try to make the case that she's the strongest general election candidate. What did you make of her performance tonight? Did she move the needle? I, I thought again, I thought again, Nikki Haley. And the first debate had about nine minutes to introduce herself. That's about what she got in the first debate with 12 million viewers watching it and the social media that uh, surrounded it two days later uh, raised a lot of money and a lot of attention. And that's what these first debates really are is the introduction. I think Nikki looks like she got about 14 minutes tonight. That's about the average. And again, she distinguished herself first as the only woman on the stage. Second is one with executive experience. And third, that she can she can take a punch and she can throw a punch. Uh, you know, to, to this, I, I was the chairman of the Republican Party that ran some of the first Fox debates uh, to, to have been held in 2008. And I did think that it was an unruly format of mm -hmm. where the people started arguing over each other. And that wasn't good for the Republican Party tonight. But what Donald Trump has is he, he needs a full stage. The stage is going to thin some more between now and the next debate. And as it thins, that 40 percent number he has and that 60 percent number of the ones that are out there that are making their move, I think Nikki Haley will continue to make a pretty strong move and a pretty strong case that she can be the president of the United States. Well, let me just as follow far as up some with of the you. others. I think yeah. I think I think they're wearing their welcome out on that stage, Kristen. That's what I think. I want to follow up with you on that, because when you look at the polling as it relates to former President Trump, boy, he's out ahead in, by double digits, both nationally and also in many of these early voting states. She's still in the single digits. I mean, is she failing to gain enough traction to stay in this race, despite the fact that she's having strong debate performances? Oh, I, I think that just the number against Joe Biden that came out when y'all's poll uh, shows you that Nikki Haley is a competitor and a contender. Uh, I don't I don't think it's even in, in, in the DNA of talking about her getting out the race. You got to you got to go down to Kristen in this about the first six states and Super Tuesday. Mm -hmm. You got to come to Iowa. That that winner may be inconsequential at times because it's a caucus. New Hampshire's important because it gives you a springboard. And then you jump into South Carolina. The one that ever since 1980 has named every nominee except for when Newt Gingrich beat Mitt Romney in South Carolina. So we'll have a big vote. She certainly is very popular here. Senator Scott is from here. Uh, I'm not sure that 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 you're going to have as many as we're used to on the ballot in South Carolina. That's Donald Trump's. Uh, uh, that's where he's got trouble coming. Is if it thins down to two or three people. And I think that's probably what's going to happen, Kristen, in the next uh, two months. And, and we noted that 
the former U.N. ambassador did make some policy differences with former President Trump. But without him being on the stage, can she make the type of headway that you think she needs to heading into a South Carolina? Well, I, I think she's got an advantage in more since she's the only woman running for president right now. And that's a big advantage with a large constituency out there in the Republican Party. In South Carolina, more women vote in the Republican primary than men. That's one of the advantages. The second advantage is she's been the governor of a really tough state. The third one is Nikki Haley is a tough candidate. She can take it as well as she can give it. And you're going to have, and at the end of the day, Donald Trump's going to get in a debate, and that's going to really set the tone for who who can be president and who can't be president. Uh, you know, again, he's making the choice not to show up. I thought everybody made the case that he ought to be there, but that's his choice. Me being a lifelong Republican, a party leader, um, I, I think it's it's disingenuous that he's not doing that and and giving it a chance. Uh, and trying to run as if he's the incumbent. You know, the fact is he lost mm -hmm. and we we, mm -hmm. we barely won the midterms. And I think the people made a good yeah. case for him to be in the next debate, but we'll see. I'm proud of what Nikki did, and, yeah. and, uh, and I think she'll see a decent size bump in that tomorrow. Yeah, we're going to have to see if he shows up at that third debate. All right, Caden Dawson, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time this evening. Let me turn now to the other South Carolinian we were just talking about. With me is Matt Gorman, Senior Communications Advisor to the Tim Scott Campaign. Matt, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Let's dive right in. As you know, Senator Scott came off of the debate stage after the first debate, and everyone said, boy, he's a nice guy, but he didn't get in many jabs. Clearly tonight he tried to shift his strategy, and he had a much more prominent role on that stage. Are you worried, though, that he waited too late to make that splash? Well, he still is a nice guy, I promise you. And no, not at all. I mean, we're, we're, we're in September. Uh, I mean, when I was here at the Reagan Library debate last time uh, with Jeb Bush and Donald Trump were center stage and Scott Walker was still in the race. So certainly not anywhere close to anywhere close to being too late. Um, but look, he was able to talk not only tonight about his vision of the country, restoring hope, creating opportunity and protecting the America we love. But, you know, look, he's going to point out policy contrast between him and the other candidates, the vague uh, Governor DeSantis, Governor Haley. That's important. As we get into this later in the process, voters need to know those things. Well, I guess the question is, we, we did see him spar more aggressively with the other candidates on the stage. We didn't see him, though, take aim at former President Trump. Does he need to shift that part of his strategy? Does he need to sharpen his tone? We saw that with Governor DeSantis. Is this a missed opportunity? I mean, Trump, after all, is the front runner. Well, you know, I was in Mason City, Iowa last week when he, by name, called out President Trump, Ron, Nikki, and Vivek on abortion, uh, on issues that are important to him, abortion, uh, whether it's spending, certainly being called bought and paid for. Uh, he's going to speak up, whether that's against Vivek or uh, former President Trump. And again, on something like life, he's not going to be afraid to. Well, and as you know, former President Trump has repeatedly, and in his interview with me, not committed to a federal ban on abortion and also yep. accused the way in which some Republicans are talking about the issue for, of abortion for some of those losses in the midterms. Is there any sense that Senator Scott needs to shift his strategy, would shift his strategy, given that assessment by the former president? Uh, no. And in fact, actually, it was your interview that Senator Scott was referring to and, and taking on uh, the former president. Look, uh, this is just personal to him. He believes this very deeply. And look, we're at the Reagan Library. Reagan was somebody who extended a hand, brought converts to the conservative cause, went to people in places that hadn't been reached out to by Republicans before. If we want to do anything on abortion, really any major issue facing this country, we need to reach out. I think Tim's bio, uh, his record, but also his just unique willingness to do that is what sets him apart from the rest of the field. And I think that's why he's a, even NBC News, their article earlier this year said that he was the uh, candidate Democrats feared the most. He, we noticed that he had a few exchanges with Vivek Ramaswamy, to put it diplomatically. 
Is there any I risk? Would say so. in, <laughs> is there any risk? I mean, obviously, Vivek Ramaswamy is a political newcomer on this stage. Uh, he seems to take a, a page out of Trump's playbook in terms of how he handles some of these debate moments. Is there any risk in mixing it up with him? Because we notice there's a lot of crosstalk, and some of those moments I think got lost for the viewers. No, I mean, Vivek was cl clearly flustered, uh, as he essentially even said, look, when you're going to call out somebody and say they're bought and paid for, that's a personal thing. That's a personal attack. So I think it was important for Senator Scott to respond and talk about Vivek's ties to the Chinese Communist Party, talk about his ties to Hunter Biden's buddy in the co Chinese Communist Party. So look, he is willing, again, as I said before, to make those policy contracts that are important and that voters need to hear about. And look, if it's important to him, um, Senator Scott, he's going to continue to make those, and I, that's what I would expect to see. And the Ramaswamy campaign has said that in 2018, his business did have ties to China, but that's not the case now. Matt Gorman, thank you so very much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate thank you, it. Kristen. And still to come from the debate stage to your living room, we're on the road checking in with a group of conservative voters in Battleground, Wisconsin, for their reaction to the night. That's after the break. You're watching Meet the Press special coverage of the second Republican presidential debate. And welcome back. We've spent the last hour breaking down the performance of each of the candidates up on the debate stage tonight. But as we've said before, it's not our opinion, but the opinions of the voters that will matter on Election Day. And we wanted to know if this debate changed anything for those voters. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster caught up with some of the voters we talked to in Wisconsin after the last debate and some new faces, too. So, Shaq, what are they telling you? What did they think of the night? Hello there. Well, Lex, look, they were very interested in the debate. We had some Italian food. We had really good conversation. I want you to introduce you. I want to introduce you to our group here again in Waukesha, Wisconsin. These are all self-described, again, conservative voters. Each of them supported President Trump in 2020. And let's start with the same question we asked this group last time around. Uh, after watching that debate, raise your hand if you're now interested in a candidate other than Donald Trump. Lisa, uh oh, interested. You're interested. interested. interested yes. yes. So three, three, three of the five people we have here. Let's start with you, Chris. Okay. Who are you now interested in, and why? I'm really interested in Ron DeSantis. I really like his uh, prior governor experience in Florida. He's taken on a lot of big, you know, companies. He's really stood firm in his issues. I also like the fact that towards the end of the debate, when they um, asked about who they would vote off the stage or vote off the island. And he took charge of that situation and said, I wouldn't vote anyone off. He goes, that's not right. That's not correct. And he turned the situation around. And that, to me, is a basic thing, basic question. But he really showed some leadership even with that. So I really like him a lot. Randy, same question to you. I think uh, the thing that differentiates all of them, to me, is their stance on uh, the war in Ukraine. So there you've got... Uh, Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy being the only two who are uh, wanting to negotiate peace. The others all want to continue the war, keep sending our money, sending our weapons. So to me, it boils down to those are the two choices. You came in and you mentioned uh, Tim Scott to me. What changed after the debate? Um, really, Tim Scott was my third choice and he remained my third choice. What I like about Tim is... Um, uh, the moderators and some of the other debaters, they all go after him for being a senator. Most of them are, have been governors, and they can point to all their accomplishments as a governor. And he keeps getting peppered with these questions about, what did you accomplish? How, how do we know that you're going to accomplish anything? And, I, and he answers as well as he can. Uh, I know he's part of, uh, you know, uh, 50 other senators, what, uh, 99 other senators, yeah, yeah. 99 other senators. So uh, he doesn't have a, a big role as, on his own, but he's been part of committees, and he can point to accomplishments of those committees. Stacey, why are you still with Trump? Um, I still, safety is number one to me, and I feel that Trump has shown us um, leadership and respect in the world as far as I'm concerned. I um, would say that if I had to pick anybody on the stage tonight, I would say DeSantis makes me feel safe, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but Chris Christie, too. Either of those two are better than the Biden fraud family that is not, I don't feel safe at all with them in the White House. Mike, you're still with Trump. Anyone else stick out? 
I love Vivek. Um, still, still do. Yep. Um, our government is broken, and I think Trump is still so popular and winning the poll, winning in the polls, because I think everyone wants to see what he can do when he comes back. Steve, quick answer here. What's your? Is this about what candidate you like best, or which candidate will defeat Biden? Uh, well, obviously, I, if I like a candidate and he can't beat Biden, it doesn't do any good for myself or the rest of the country. So it is important to have a candidate that we know can be successful. Um, has the last four years been able to turn previous tr anti-Trump people into now supporting him because they look back at his record and his success in what he did policy-wise, and now they're willing to overlook some of the uh, personal issues that they voted against him for. So I, don't, I think a lot of people did not vote against him because of his policies, because of his personality. Are they willing to overlook that because situations have changed now? And last question before I toss back to you. Raise your hand if you want to see President Trump in the next debate. Kristen, there you have it. Wow. It's so fascinating, Shaq, and it's just fascinating to see that this debate may have changed some minds. So thank you for that phenomenal conversation. I just got a statement from Chris Lasavita, who is the Trump campaign senior advisor. I'll read the last part of it, which says the RNC should immediately put an end to any further primary debates so we can train our fire on Joe Biden. I won't read the whole thing, but that indicates he may not be willing to go to the third debate. You heard one of the voters there talk about Ukraine as an issue. I want to play a quick exchange with the candidates on Ukraine and then just get everyone's reaction on the other side. It's in our interest to end this war, and that's what I will do as president. We are not going to have a blank check. We will not have U.S. troops. We have got to defend the American people before we even worry about all these other things. Let's debate the fact that our national vital interest is in degrading the Russian military. By degrading the Russian military, we actually keep our homeland safer, we keep our troops at home, and we all understand Article 5 of NATO. Just because Putin people. is not an evil, Putin's an evil dictator does not mean that Ukraine is good. This is a country that has banned 11 opposition parties. A win that has for actually, Russia is a win for China. That is not true. China. We're driving Russia. For Russia excuse is a me, win for ex China. excuse me, if you'll have but a chance. I forgot, you like you'll China. Have, That's no, why you're you'll have, you'll have your chance in just a moment. We need a reasonable peace plan to end this, especially this is a country whose president just last week Vivek, was if hailing you let Nazi Putin in have ranks. Ukraine, that's a green and, light and to China is, to take Taiwan. We need a peace plan comes plan through strength. Be. All right, and the panel is back with me. Hallie, let me start with you there, because you heard that voter say that this issue of Ukraine is actually a big issue. We know that they're fighting over over this issue on Capitol Hill right now as a part of the spending battle, yeah. whether they're going to keep the government. Let open. me tell you, the shack in Wisconsin with voters segment is, is quickly best. becoming my favorite yeah. of all of these uh, post debate conversations. Already yeah, my but, favorite. But like, solidifies <laughs> yeah. it. Um, because yeah. I think that where you, what you're seeing, there is not uniformity inside right. the Republican That's right. Party on what That's to right. do with Ukraine, right? And so that is what debates are supposed to be for. That is the point of having a debate, is to illustrate some of these policy differences. You played a little bit of it there, but that also highlighted something else that has been a through line now, I think in this debate in particular, which is the sort of Vivek Ramaswamy, Nikki Haley mm. clash, right? Now, again, if you're looking into the context of the broader race with Donald Trump clearly dominating in the polls, you know, does it really matter, you know, this and that and what, what happens? It matters in some of these key early states, right? So Nikki Haley is going to want to have some, a boost there. Vivek Ramaswamy, you heard that other gentleman say that he's very interested in Vivek Ramaswamy. And I think that on foreign policy, you mm. have somebody who has you know, no experience in foreign policy, and you have somebody who's a former U.N. ambassador, and it is an interesting way to, again, highlight their contrast in some of these issues. Too. Hugh, it really is one of the biggest divides right now within the Republican Party happening against the backdrop of the Reagan library. Yeah, the commander-in-chief question came up three or four times yeah. tonight, and I thought when the commander-in-chief, I think Dana asked the best question, which asked about the 9-11 question, mm. but the Ukraine question is the same. The TikTok question that Vivek dodged yeah. did not do him well in the commander-in-chief category. I do think I come back to the three people I mentioned. Who can you imagine in the White House on a crisis day? It's Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, and Chris Christie. And I think as it settles out over the course of the day, we're going to see more people think about commander-in-chief questions, and one of them being Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Lonnie? Well, you've got a couple of candidates uh, in particular who are running against where I think the majority of Republican voters are right now. The majority of Republican voters do not believe that we should be continuing to send money and help to Ukraine. 
And that position is the one that Ramaswamy has taken. It's certainly the former president's position. And to a certain degree, it's DeSantis' position. And so I think it'll be interesting to see if they're going to maintain that position or as this settles out, Hugh, to your point, did they start to then pivot toward a position to be a more traditional Republican position articulated by Nikki Haley, for example, which is, no, we have to continue supporting Ukraine because it matters what happens there to our national security here. Leah, not only is it the former president's position, but he said to Republicans on Capitol Hill, shut down the government if you don't get what you want. And one of the things that they're demanding is that this aid pa or this new spending bill does not include new aid for Ukraine. You're seeing this divide in the Republican Party on the debate stage. You're seeing this divide on Capitol Hill between Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell and the different factions of the Republican Party. And this is going to be a central issue I think, in this campaign um, moving forward. And it's a tension between the America First and the Reagan component of the Republican Party. And uh, we don't, I think we do know which one is going to win mm -hmm. out. The America First seems to be growing in momentum. Mm -hmm. But um, there's some old guard Republicans who are trying to hold on to this, uh, this you know, traditional Republican interference type of yeah. philosophy. I want to go around the horn very quickly because we have 40 seconds left. <laughs> Did anything change tonight, Leanne? Nothing changed. A Democratic uh, Biden campaign aide texted me and said, I don't think we need to watch the third debate. Mm. Hallie? I, I, I hate to have a, I don't have a crystal ball. We don't know yet. I think yeah. time will tell. But I think based on the numbers that we've seen so far, what, what could have moved the needle? I don't know. Yeah. I think it did because people will leave the stage. And when we get down to fewer people, there will be more questions with more time to answer coherently and not so chaotically. That could be the one thing that really changes the equation if people Depending start Depending on leave. the RNC yeah. criteria. Lonnie? Yeah. I mean, I, look, I think Nikki Haley continues to cement her position as the principal alternative and the person who is the best contrast against uh, the president. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Hallie Jackson, Leanne Caldwell, Lonnie Chen, and Hugh Hewitt. Thank you. Thank you for being with us this hour. We will have more news and analysis tomorrow and every weekday after 4 p.m. Eastern on Meet the Press Now. Have a good night. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.